Hello everyone, welcome back to Speaking Spurs and it is transfer time with not one but two players signed through the door. You would have seen already the announcement of Timo Verma uh, into Tottenham Hotspur and Dragusin's medical is complete. We're just waiting for the announcement from Spurs, which will either happen late tonight or at some point tomorrow. Um, so we'll talk about Dragusin first because the majority of you would have already... Um, read stuff or watch stuff on Timo Werner so then that gives everybody the option if you want to stick around for the Timo Werner stuff to do so but essentially what I'm going to do is go through um, the deal of Dragusin, talk a bit about um, the past and, and what we can expect from him and then I'll do the same for Timo Werner so exciting times and um, for those of you that actually care um, my eye it's not healed, it's actually got worse today. So I've had a antihistamine, given it a saline solution bath, and uh, yeah, good fun. So right, jumping into it. Dragusin has signed a contract till 2029, believed to be around two and a half million per year, um, which is about 50k a week. There was um, a lot of sort of talk that he might come in on a similar contract to Vicario, which would have put him on around 75k a week, but it is believed to be 50k a week, which for a 21-year-old is not bad going. I mean, I wouldn't complain at all. So it was a massive saga, as we all know. We had... His agent had come out and basically said that he was in no rush to leave um, Genoa. And I kind of get that. It makes sense because if a deal doesn't go through, he doesn't want to ruffle any feathers with the fan base there. Um, so I feel like a lot of that was just talk, but actually I think if he had have stayed there, he'd have been quite happy and that will become more evident when we talk about sort of the trajectory of his career so far. However, there were other clubs in for him. I believe Napoli was one of the clubs that, um, were very interested in him. I think a couple of Premier League clubs were also kind of interested and then Bayern Munich decided to jump in. So in a nutshell, we had an offer accepted for Dragusin, um, by Genoa. And then Bayern Munich at the last minute decided to come in with a bid as well. And then it was kind of all left up to um, uh, Radu Dragusin to Radu Dragusin, sorry, to make a decision. Now, we sweetened the deal a little bit more uh, to Genoa because we have offered them Jed Spence to go there on loan for the remainder of the season, which they've accepted mainly because as part of the the Dragusin deal, we are also going to pay 100% of Jed Spence's wages. Now, that's kind of unheard of in loan deals for 100% of the wages to be done, especially for a player that has come in that would have been on a OK first team wage. So it's a lot of money, but it got the deal over the line. And Dragusin actually chose us over Bayern Munich. Um, so, yeah, as I said, he travelled for his medical today. Um, his agent has had his mind blown. Now, I don't know if it's just the agent trying to get his five minutes of fame, but he was basically saying they sat up all night talking over the deals um, just to make sure that, well, the player made the right decision in the end. And um, I think for Radu, it's probably the right decision at this stage of his career because there is no guarantee that he was going to be a starter for Bayern Munich. We know that Romero and Van der Ven have had their injury, so we might not want to rush both of them straight back in. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take Dragusin to settle into the squad anyway, but uh, you know, Ange Postacoglu is not the sort of guy that would go hunt for a player that is going to take a long, long time to settle in. So there is a chance we could see him quite quickly partnering um, Van der Ven um, because he's on the mend and pretty much ready to play. We know he was on the, the bench for the last game and wasn't actually risked in the end. And it was Sessegnon that was the player that came back from injury in that game. So that could be the two that play. Um, so, yes, let's talk a bit more about what his agent said. Um, he said, I can't believe we turned down Bayern. Radu gave his word to Spurs and chose to respect it. So there you go. For us, there's a bit of integrity, which is something that you don't see a lot of these days in the game because ultimately they don't have particularly long careers and you make as much money as you can. Um, especially when you're going to foreign clubs, they have no real um, connection to us or any, any need to, although us as fans would love to pretend they do. So the agent said he's still a bit mind blown. So the deal itself was a 25 million fee. There's then 5 million, uh, so it's 25 million euros with 5 million euros in add-ons plus Jed Spence on loan for the remainder of the season with 100% of the wages. So potentially that's what, 30 million euros. There probably would have been a 
a fee for a loan initially. So you can chuck in another, what, 2 million. So that would have been 32 million euros plus his wages for the rest of the season. So you can be looking, what, 34, 35 million that that deal is worth to them. Um, so yeah, Daniel Levy was obviously a big help and was serious about getting the deal done because we can see that it's evident with him willing to pay Spence's wages. Um, and to be fair, Spence was just going to sit in the in the youth, uh, what is it, the under-23s or whatever, and that's where he was going to be playing for the rest of the season because it's believed the reason why he had the the fall down the pecking order at Spurs is because of his attitude in pre-season. He was turning up late. The attitude wasn't particularly great. This is probably why Leeds have decided to terminate his loan as well. And ultimately, Ange won't stand for that. He wants players that work hard, that are really committed to the, the club. And that's what we as fans should want anyway. It shouldn't matter what their talent is. If they're not willing to put the effort in, it's kind of disruptive for the squad. It's not, not fair on players that aren't playing behind them, that do have the right attitude. So look, hopefully he can go out there. He's 23 years old. Hopefully he's realised now. He'll go to another country, see a different way and perspective of things. I mean, I say a different country. He went to France last season and didn't learn anything. But hopefully, you know, this will make him more grounded and he'll come back a, a better player. But yes, so the Romanian, uh, we'll talk a bit about his past. He um, signed for Genoa at the beginning uh, for on loan originally, at the beginning of the 22-23 season from Juventus. And then it was made permanent last summer. Uh, so far this season, he's made 19 Serie A appearances with three clean sheets and two goals. In 2018, when he chose to go to Juventus, uh, Chelsea, PSG and Atletico Madrid were all actually interested in him, but he did choose Juventus. Um, he signed as an under-17 player and quickly moved up to the under-19s. And then on the 8th of November in the 2019-20 season, uh, he was called up by Andrea Pirlo, to the first team for a game against Lazio and was unused. He made his European and club debut on the 2nd of December um, of that year as a substitute against Dynamo Kiev um, in the Champions League group stage. Um, he made his league debut in the 90th minute as a substitute actually against Genoa. Um, he earned a four-year extension to his contract because of the, the uh, performances that he'd been putting in, not only for you know, in first team training, but also the contribution that he made to the um, the youth sides as well. But he was then loaned out to Sampdoria. Um, that loan ended in January. There's not a lot of information as to why it ended. Um, but after that, he then went on loan to uh, Selenatana for the rest of the season. They, um, yeah, so that was two loans in one season. And then in July 2022, he was loaned to Serie B side Genoa with an option to buy. He made the permanent move there for five and a half million euros with 1.8 million euros in bonuses. He made 40 appearances and had four goals in the 22-23 season as Genoa finished second in the league of Serie B, which actually earned them instant promotion to Serie A. Um, yeah, and has kind of gone on leaps and bounds from there. If you want to talk about him on the international scene, he has been present all the way through, uh, under 16s, 17s, 19s, 21s, and then has 13 caps um, as a full international. He started all 10 of the matches of the Euro 2024 qualifiers, and they won their group as well. So look, he's kind of going from height to height. He's worked his way hard. He's gone down to Serie B, done his bits. He's a player that a lot of people are interested in. So let's talk a bit about him as a player. Well, first of all, he's tall. He's physical. Um, he's a centre-back that can also be deployed at, deployed, deployed at right-back as well. And with the injury crisis that we have at this club, it's handy to have players that can play multiple positions. Q Timo Werner. Um, if you're going to compare him to any other centre-back um in the modern era, it would be Virgil van Dijk. And that's somebody that somebody admits himself that he's tried to mould his game on. Um, his point, uh, point of reference, really. He's good in possession, which is something Ange obviously looks for. But his positioning is very, very good as well. So all round, I think, is, is an excellent deal for the club. He's 21 years old, so time is very much on his side. He's got a decent bit of pace about him. Um, he's not Mickey van de Venquick, but um, yeah, he can hold his own. A good tackler good on the ball everything about this deal kind of makes sense um especially at this time and we're very lucky to get him because let's face it 
Bayern Munich are an incredible club. And, you know, our own captain, Harry Kane, our, one of our best, if not best player of all time, left us for Bayern Munich. But Dragu Ragusin has decided, decide, I can't talk today, decided to snub Bayern for Tottenham. Now, there's plenty of songs already doing the rounds on social media. Um, about what they're going to be. There's some good ones to so check them out. And I hope you'll all be singing them at the stadium when he makes his debut. Um, what does this mean centre-back-wise? Well, Ben Davies is obviously out injured at the moment. Um, Dyer is sort of like uh, the player that we're expecting to go out. So with Dyer, and it's really weird because Bayern Munich were linked with a move for Eric Dyer only at the last minute to decide for, to go for Jagrusin. Which is amazing because they're very, very different players and different defenders. Now, the idea behind Dyer is the fact that he's versatile, can play right back, he can play as a holding midfielder, he's a good passer of the ball, uh, he's good in the air. So I get it. But it just seems that now they've lost out on the deal of Radu Dragusin, the talks have intensified again for Eric Dyer. And it just seems very strange that they've gone from Dyer to Dragusin, lost out on him, gone back to Dyer. They're such different players, it's, it's unbelievable. But. Um, so hopefully that one will go through. There have been talks between Bayern Munich and Tottenham about Eric Dyer. You know, from our perspective, we're happy to let him go. And I feel like if he can get enough playing time there or the view of a decent amount of playing time, I think he'll take it. If not, I think he could be well off going back home to um, to Portugal. That'd be a good place for him. But there's plenty of clubs he could still play at, including in the Premier League, just whether he would want to. So... Yeah, centre-back-wise, that would leave us with Dragusin, Van der Ven, Romero and then Ben Davies um, once they're all back completely fit. Do we need one more as cover? There is a possibility. Tanganga's loan hasn't gone particularly well, so there is a chance. You know, as the window progresses, maybe he could be recalled and reintegrated into the squad, but he could also help out the under-23s. So that's a possibility. Uh, Joe Rodon is doing wonderfully on his loan, so I would leave him where he is for now. Um, but yeah, now let's move on to Timo Werner. Uh, the thing that was very strange about this one is when deals are coming about, you hear about them in advance. Um, you know, Dragusin, this is dragged on for a very long time. And, and first, it was rumours that we were interested in him. There was no rumours cir circulating whatsoever that we were interested in Timo Werner. It just happened. The announcement came up on um, Sky Sports News saying that Tottenham in discussions for a loan deal for Timo Werner just came out of the blue, which is why nobody had been reporting on it. So he's come in on loan till the end of the season from RB Leipzig with a £15 million um, pound option or €15 million Euro option to buy. He's going to take the number 16. Um, he's had his interviews already. There was shots of his medical that went up on social media today, a little bit where he was doing some uh, work, in uh, some floor work, and I think it was Benton Core that came in and uh, greeted him. So behind this one, uh, there was other Premier League clubs interested in him, as many as four other Premier League clubs that were looking at an option to bring him in. So Johan Lange, um, who some of you will know, some won't, is one of the new people that have come into the club that are helping with recruitment. Um, and Ange Postacoglu himself were both pivotal in this role going through. They played a massive part with their, their conversations with him. And it seems to be like whoever Ange speaks to then comes in. He had the conversation with James Madison and Madison has said one of the things that he was told is that whether you come to Spurs or not, you're going to see a very, very different Tottenham to the one that there's been for the last few years. And that intrigues players because they know with the players that we've got, the Tottenham we can be. Um, and I think Ange is just one of those people when he's talking, you listen, he draws you in, he makes you want to be part of it. So, uh, yeah, I think... It's a good option because we know Sonny is going to be coming back. So if it doesn't work out, it's not a huge loss because we can revert him back out onto the left wing. Um, or Sonny will just take the wing and he can be an impact player off of the bench. He can play anywhere across the front three, which is a bit of a luxury. We know he's got the pace. So let's talk a bit about his style of play. So his actual nickname is Turbo Timo. Uh, because of his acceleration and pace, something that you need all day long and fitness within this um, Ange Postacoglu system. He's direct, hard-working, and a very, very all-round energetic forward. 
Um, he actually played as a winger in his youth a lot more until he was moved more centrally as a um, he started to break through. He's an intelligent player. He's always been praised for his determination and willingness to drop deep, to retrieve the ball or link up with other midfielders. Um, he's got really, really good movement off the ball. Sometimes his movement's a little too good because he's caught offside quite a bit, which is one of his weaknesses. He loves to cut in from the left onto his favoured right foot, although he's not afraid to do so, cutting in from the right onto his left foot. Um, he's actually got good accuracy with his shooting. And sometimes with quicker players, they lose a bit of power and accuracy uh, with their shots because of the sheer pace. Um, and I feel like he doesn't really suffer too much from the, the accuracy. It's more the power in his shots because of the pace he's going at. Um, physicality and aerial uh, presence... Uh, well, I say aerial presence. He should have the presence because, you know, he's got he's got decent height on him. He's not a small player by any imagination. But yeah, his aerial abilities, shall we say, his physicality and his ability to hold up the ball are probably three of his busy, biggest weaknesses. And obviously, creeping offside like Richarlison is also a bit of an annoyance. So, I think this is a good signing because he can play in multiple positions, which. Um, and just going to be a massive, massive fan of. So let's talk a bit about his um, about his past. But I'll also forget to mention, yes, we know he's 27 years old. And also he's 5 foot 11. So he should be better in the air, really. But yeah, talking about his past. So he started his professional career in uh, Stuttgart 2013 to 16, where he played 130 games, but only scored 14 goals. But as I said earlier in his career, he was more of a winger. And at that age, you're more trying to learn the game rather than scoring the goals. You're up against physical defenders when you're not as physical or developed at that age. So completely understandable. Then he moves to RB Leipzig. Um, he was there for two spells, the 2016 to 2020 season, and then back for the 2022 to 24. In that time, he's played 213 games where he's got 113 goals. So he moves to Chelsea uh, for the 2020-2022 seasons where he plays 89 games and only scores 23 goals. Now, if you look back at his time at Chelsea, some people say it wasn't actually that successful as a spell, mainly because he had some glaring misses, a lot of chances and just didn't score anywhere near as many goals as he did. A bit like you're seeing right now with Darwin Nunez at um, at Liverpool. However, Darwin Nunez is younger and still kind of, you know, learning and plying his trade. But actually, it's when you look at something more interesting. So I looked at his assists in his time at Chelsea across those two seasons. So he got the 23 goals, but he also got 15 assists. Now, if you break that down into goal contributions, bearing in mind he didn't always play through the middle. He would play out wide from time to time. That means he had a goal contribution, goal or assist, every 2.3 games. Which isn't actually too bad, considering he wasn't always through the middle. So his stats are actually better than you think. Um, and he had more of an impact there. Than you would have thought. But yeah, he did eventually end up going back to Leipzig. So we know he can play anywhere across the forward line. He's actually held records as well. So he was the youngest player to make 50 appearances and 100 appearances in the Bundesliga, which were then broken by Kai Havertz. Um, but he is the first, um, he is the youngest player to make 150 appearances in the Bundesliga. So the 2016-17 season, he actually scored 21 Bundesliga goals, which meant he was the top scorer in the league that season. So the capability for him to do these things is there. I think it just comes down to, to confidence and possibly the team that you're in, the people that you're playing with. Um, so we know it's there. We know he can do it. Hopefully he can do it at Spurs with Big Ange. So it was actually a 47.5 million release clause that was triggered by Chelsea that saw him go there on the five-year deal. His first... Chelsea goal actually came against us. Yes, against Tottenham in a 1-1 all draw on the 29th of September in the EFL Cup. Um, but we then went on to beat them 5-4 on penalties, so it's all good. He actually did okay at Chelsea, as I've said, because if you look at those stats, it's not as bad as you think. It's just everybody remembers the howlers because some people still think that Jorelio Gomez was a bad goalkeeper at Spurs because he made some errors that were classed as big in games. But actually, he saved us in more games than he let us down in. A bit like Lloris, over time, he's definitely saved us in more games than he's cost us. Um, yeah, and then August 2022, he goes back to RB Leipzig 
They signed him on a four-year deal, uh, 25.3 million, I believe they paid for him. And then on November 2022, he actually suffered an ankle injury. That ruled him out of the 2022 World Cup um, in Qatar. Uh, He scored his 100th Bundesliga goal in April 2023. So if you look at him on the international stage for Germany, he's represented them at under 15, 16, 17, 19 and the 21s. And then his full international caps um, have seen him have 30 four goals in the 48 caps so he's got a good return there as well so as you can see it's quite evident that putting the right situation with the right teammates um with the correct self-belief that there is a player in there that can do things so i see this as a positive one um his interview was very good Uh, something that i was pleased that he spoke about was he didn't say trophies he called it titles um He's come here for titles. He spoke about when he came to the Premier League the first time round that, you know, he came to win titles and they won the, they won, was it it the Champions League? Or whatever, but he won something whilst he was at Chelsea. I don't really care about Chelsea. He spoke about the fact that he likes the manager, he likes the style of football we play, that, you know, everybody always talks about the stadium whenever they come to Spurs. So look, it's good signs from him. Um, He will wear the number 16. So let's just... It's a bit of a weird number. I mean, nobody wants the number 16 because ultimately you want a number from 1 to 11. Um, Some players have favourite numbers that they take on. So if we have a look at our previous number 16s over the years, and I believe I... I think I've got them in the order that they had them. Um, Mickey Hazard, Ronnie Rosenthal, Clive Wilson, Chris Armstrong, Stefan Everson, Paul Koncheski, Reto Ziegler... Lee Young Pyo, Gareth Bale, who then passed it on to his Welsh compatriot Chris Gunter, uh, or Gunter, uh, Kyle Norton, Kieran Trippier, Kyle Walker Peters, and the most recent to where it was our Loney Arnout Danjuma. So looking through that list is actually a mixture really of strikers and fullbacks. Um, but yeah, so it's not really a famous number as such because most of those players that have donned that number then went on to take a different number once they've kind of settled into the squad and taken over from the person that had that spot before them. So uh, I don't think it's going to be a, a number that we're going to retire or um, is going to set the world alight based on the number it is, but the number does not make the man. Um, so yeah. It's a pretty good day for Spurs. Rumours are we're still looking at a central midfielder. Now we've got a centre-back and a forward in. Um, The central midfielder, that will very much depend on what happens with Pierre and Mohoibjerg and possibly Oliver Skip. Oliver Skip has pretty much put his foot down and said he wants to stay and fight for his place, which I respect. And it helps us out in the homegrown quota, other than the fact that we were looking to bring in Conor Gallagher. Now, what I would say on that, Conor Gallagher, yes, is going to cost us about 45, 50 million, which is a lot of money. However, again, homegrown. He's playing his best football um, in the time that he's been at Chelsea. Obviously, we saw him play very good football at Crystal Palace. So, again, we know that can happen. Um, Postacoglu is a big admirer of Conor Gallagher because of his, again, like Werner, it's his work rate, determination, the fact that he's a box to box midfielder. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like if I was Oliver Skip, I would probably go out on loan. I know he wants to fight for his plays. And I know he's also thinking that you've got two midfielders right now away at the African Cup of Nations. And lacelso has got a minor injury at the moment, so it means he probably will play. But I think for him, he needs to go out and get the regular game time again because he's not a bad player. And I think the reason we criticise him is because he comes on, has not long on the pitch, and his confidence isn't quite there. He's a little bit rusty, so his passes and the progressive nature aren't quite as good. He, He will make mistakes as he's trying to get into the tempo of the game. Um, and I think he just needs to go somewhere where he makes an impact and is loved like he did um, on loan at Norwich. He was incredible there. And Postacoglu at the moment, because of the absentees we've got, he keeps playing him in the number eight role when we all know he's a number six. But the issue is, Hoybier is a number six as well. And at the moment, Hoybier is a better player than Skip. So I think for him, the right thing to do is go out on loan. Um, and then that might mean that actually Hoybier has to stay till the end of the season. But we can look, look bring Conor Gallagher in. Uh, or it might just be that you keep Hoybier till later in the window. Bring Conor Gallagher in to start getting embedded in. And then depending on how far uh, Bazuma and Saar respectively go with their nations in the AFCON, they might be back a little bit earlier than you'd think. So it kind of works that way. It'll be an interesting one. But yeah, we are still looking at a central midfielder. Um, and it is probably 
if any more players come in, I think we will be looking at homegrown or we're going to have to be very smart in the players that we let go. So that is it. Yes, Timo Werner in the door, Dragusin in the door, one alone, one a permanent. Let me know in the comments below what you think of those players coming in. I know there's going to be a lot of split opinions on Timo Werner. But yeah, post in the comments below. I will reply uh, to you if I can, and depending on how many comments there are. Don't forget to support the video with a like. And until next time, come on you Spurs.